know what we're going today. <laughs> today, my goodness, mental health in you. With we're going to talk about things like black women and mental health. You know, uh, we're as a as a as a female, particularly as women of color, we've always been uh, going through stuff. History has shown that we are strong from Harriet Tubman on down to Michelle Obama to Camilla Harris. We are strong women. We're always out here making history. We're always out here trying to make something out of nothing. And we're doing that. We're doing it by faith. We're doing it through our activism, you know, through resistance. And we're doing it because that's what we need to do. That's what is in our DNA. I, I, sometimes I just, we, we just can't help ourselves. But in the midst of that, how are we taking care of ourselves? How are we taking care of our mental health, our physical health, our spiritual health, and all of that? So to help me un unravel all of this, to help me through the maze of all of this, is two great women activists. And I'm, I'm very honored to have them on Mental Health in You today. First is Nigel Howard, activist and mental health counselor, mother, and all these women of faith. And, you know, she's going to help me unravel a lot of these things. Also, Jamila Austin, mental health. Uh, well, you can be a mental health counselor, but you're a filmmaker. Um, my fellow Bronx Net um, Access producer, historian. And I'm so happy to have you as well. So um, let's get into it, ladies. I mean, in the wake of everything going on today, from covert to the uprising for racial justice, us still having to uh, talk about how our black lives matter. After all these years, I mean, how, how are you dealing with all of this, Nigel? What, in your, your, you know, in your day in, day out world, as an activist, as a mental health counselor, how are you trying to hold it together? How you're trying to, you know, put your mark on the movement, your stamp. Well, you know, I, thank you so much, Cynthia, for having me on Mental Health and You. Uh, it's such a pleasure and an honor to be here once again. Um, I was on here before, and it's just an honor to be in your presence. And, uh, and I'm honored to even be on, uh, considered to be on the show. So I just wanted to, you know, to, to unravel. That's a, a very mighty question, especially in the midst of COVID and quarantine. Mm. I think I want to first start off by saying that, for me, um, God is everything. And... Okay you know, faith gets the final say. So whether it's going to happen or it's not going to happen, I have to maintain my faith. So I, I wanted to say that first because it's very difficult to cope during these times. Mm -hmm. As mothers, we're dealing with our children, you know, homeschooling now. Um, then we have to deal with COVID being locked up in the house, social distancing. We're away from family and friends and socializing ourselves. So it's like, okay, we have levels of isolation and there may be changes in our mood and how our eating habits and being overly tired or, or maybe not sleeping enough, you know. So we go through so many changes. I know myself, um, even with the heat, so much has been going on it's like, I don't even have time. I'm, I'm hot. Like I need to shower all the time, <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause I'm very, very hot, you know? So the heat and then not being able to socialize, I've seen that, you know, I've even put on a little bit of weight. That's something that we as women do right in this, in this time. So we're going to have to pivot. And I realized even in my own personal life, I'm going to have to pivot my lifestyle and the things that I'm doing because I don't get out to exercise and hop on the subway the way I used to. I'm in New York. So I'm a New Yorker. And so I was accustomed to hopping on a bus and hopping in the subway. And now that I'm not doing that, I'm working remotely from home with my clients. I realize that I'm not getting the uh, excess of exercise that we need on a regular, regular basis to keep ourselves mentally, emotionally, physically fit and strong. And in the midst of, you know, all of the racial unjust and the discrimination that we are um, un unpacking today, just as uh, women of color, 
um, and 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 just women, period, just women. It is so unfortunate what we're going through, uh, dealing with white privilege and and just the whole discrimination that in and of itself um, can increase our levels of depression as well as anxiety. So there's so many different coping skills right now that we have to put in place to help keep us leveled in the midst of all that we're going through. So some of the things that I know I've been practicing even in my own personal life is just being able to reduce stress, getting people out of my life or getting things out of my way that might incorporate stress into my space. So reduce- nice, nice. before you go on about that, we're going to talk about how we're dealing with that. The, our yeah. skills. But I just want to, I want to ask Shamila, how are you dealing with all of this? How's your activism taking shape? You know, how's it uh, refi- refining it? in this age of COVID, in this age of racial, you know, unrest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, I mean, when we look at it, the, the, the world practically shut down in March. It's been almost six months, you know, Mm -hmm. and you almost don't even realize how much time has gone by. So for me, I, What I did, and I do have a background in psychology and mental health, but what I tried to do was figure out how to make this period as as productive as I could possibly make it. And so this this whole period of being, let's say, like you say, under self-quarantine, because no matter how much they're saying, oh, things are getting better, you keep hearing about the next person that's dying, you know. Yeah, and yeah. you don't want to be that one person that gets it, that one devastation that you hear about. And so I've had to, you know, I maintain contact with my family through through the telephone. Um, but I've had to learn how to make, how to use this time proactively. And for me, as a filmmaker and an activist, it's given me the time that I've needed to do the work that I needed to do, to be able to just sit back and reflect on and, and, and put in the study and put in the concentrated time because otherwise, usually I'm on the hustle. I'm out in the street all the time. I'm at this event. I'm trying to develop, get more clients and everything. And the world has completely stopped. So it's made me have to, one, as a filmmaker, look at how, to, how what's the next step? Because we're not going to just be in public venues. We're not going to be at a concert. Whether I'm doing video, film, or still photography, that's about being out in the street. And so it's changed. We're not going to have that. So it's helped me to look at this this new adaptation of technology, why we were on Zoom today, which is, you know, we weren't even thinking about this a year ago. And so Mm -hmm. how do I utilize this new technology to develop my business and my company and still be able to do a service? So that's part of what I've been doing. You know, it's interesting that you said that because I think before last year, ladies, I don't think I had been on Zoom more than like a handful of times. For this year, rather. I don't think I had been on Zoom or Google Meets or Skype or whatever you have it, you know, not even on FaceTime, you know, uh, more than a handful of times. So now in the, in this in these new times that we find ourselves in, you know, it's it's a new reality. It's like if I'm going to keep up with um, some friends, I'm going to keep up with some family, if I'm just going to maintain my sanity in some sort of way, if I'm going to continue with this show, which I think is so important, particularly this type of show in the midst of everything, it, it, it stands the reason that I'm going to have to uh, Zoom. I'm going to have to Google. I'm going to have to, you know, I dare say face, you know, FaceTime on my phone, you know, and um, it's not always easy, but I think it's necessary. And you talked about, Nigel, being a person of faith. And oftentimes, you know, during this time, I guess I have questioned my faith, mm. you know. I, I know I, I believe in God. Uh, I, I consider myself a Christian, but oftentimes I, I find myself depressed. Mm. And, you know, uh, and and I'm questioning my faith, mm. you know, and I, sometimes I just don't know. 
if I can be, if I can share, you know, not only with you ladies, but with, you know, who's ever reach, I'm reaching out there. Absolutely. Absolutely. I pray, I, I, I meditate, you know, I, I try to remember some of the, the hymns and the songs that we used to sing back in the day in church, you know, uh, uh, I have these images of my mother and, and my grandmother who long gone and my aunt, you know? It's not that I want to join them, not right now, you know? I still love Jesus. I just don't want to meet him right now, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> 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 that <day's the> <laughs> you know, I, I love you, Jesus, but I just don't want to meet you face to face right now. You know? right. <laughs> but yes, I mean... Uh, because we've got you know, work to do. Well, you know, <laughs> yes, yeah. we got work to do. So when I'm starting to feel like that, still for me, we, as we talk about coping and things we're doing, you know, uh, for me, I, I, I like going to the water. There's such a renewal and a strength and a, 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 a renewal and a, a, a just a just just a feel good feeling when I get by the water. I think I've shared on this show before that I'm a sailor. But not just being in a boat, but just being walking along the seashore and walking along the waterfront. That's that's for me. It. And then when I, I do that, I, I somehow, some way, Nigel and Jamila, I, 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 I tend to talk to God. You know, that faith that I, I thought I was questioning is somehow, some way, it's like I find it again in the midst of quiet. Absolutely. In the midst of, you know, and I, I find my purpose, like, you know, I find my reason. Absolutely. And uh, I have to remember that. I have to remember that. And uh, it's not easy, but it certainly is necessary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So well, you're definitely making room for it. You're definitely making room for, for, for something to change and difference to happen in your life when you go out and say, okay, I'm just going to let my hair down and be by the water and just going me and God, you know, and one of the things I've learned is that, you know, the Bible says faith without work is dead. So even though we put in our work, we got to maintain our faith. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where our purpose comes in at. That's where our, our drive comes in at, you know, our, our joy is and our strength is in the Lord. And so that's where we get our power from. And so, you know, we have to connect with, you know, him by going out and, and doing something that relieves us from the everyday hustle and bustle. So whether it's going out in the water, you know, taking a boat out and, you know, being by the water by yourself and just reflecting, whether it's yeah. having a paper and pen and just, you know, yeah. being able to write, you know, and, and being able to say, you know what, this is just my time right here, right now. Even if it's just, you know, sitting by a window and opening up a book and just reading and letting the new words capture and take you away into a whole nother land, you know, where your imagination begins to really flourish. That right there is connecting with the higher power. That's connecting, but that's also keeping you focused and away mm -hmm. from the the hustle and bustle of your everyday reality is taking you away from that for a little while, which is part of your self-care. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Jamila, as you were saying, you know, well, like for me, part of what, how I've kind of, I went into myself and then I also started looking at, you know, what is it, what is it that I'm, how am I supposed to utilize this time as a way of, healing myself, getting stronger, and then preparing to carry on my work, we'll say, as yeah, an yeah, activist. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, for me, I've, I've, I've been engaged in a whole lot of study. I mean, um, I'm like a full-time student. I've, I'm on, on I've, I've taken a course on the reconstruction, studying the reconstruction era that was through the facing history organization. But it's been an incredible experience because there's so many pieces that we don't really know. And that part of history has to be analyzed and put out there so that we know what's the next step in our struggle. How are we, why are we making these demands? You know, the beauty um, the, the beauty out of the tragedy of George Floyd's death is that the world has stood up and said no more. But past the protest, how are we organizing? What is it that we don't really understand that we need to know so that we are stronger in our fight and in our demands? So part of what I've been doing is engaged in a whole lot of 
study on, and like I said, looking at our history, looking how it applies to our struggle today. Uh, and then as a filmmaker, I've been, you know, refining my editing skills. It's yes. been a chance to just really sit there and look at how I'm editing, perfecting my skills. And I'm also in two classes. I'm doing a screenwriting class, of which we both are in. The yes. First time I'm, first time I'm attempting to write my own screenplay. And I've worked on everybody else's screenplay. So it's given me a chance. The Reconstruction um, Project has allowed me for the first time to write from my own inner self. Uh, and I'm usually, I'm always a writer doing technological writing about computers and software. But now for the first time, I'm, I'm writing, I'm doing the history and finally writing. It's going from my head into my arm and onto paper. And that's a beautiful Amen. experience. Amen. So we've taken the screenwriting course. Now it's allowed me now to be creative. And I'm not sure exactly what story I feel that I do need at some point tell a historical piece. But then I'm also looking at possibly telling a story about women and their destinies and their journeys. So I'm kind of caught between those two. But in addition to the screenplay, when I'm also doing a directing class as well, which is to refine my directing skills. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy that I'm doing a lot of stuff and it's all part of the self-development. In addition, mm -hmm. there are so many free programs, plays, you yeah, know, yeah. music groups, everything. So if you really search, you don't have time to be bored. It's about trying to find what your interest is and going yeah, yeah. there because it's out there. I'm New York City Health Commissioner Oxides Barbo. As the city's doctor, I have an urgent plea on behalf of all New Yorkers. Stay home. When you go out, you risk contracting or spreading coronavirus to others. You put others at risk of serious illness and even death. When you do have to go out for essentials like groceries or medicine, try to keep at least six feet between yourself and others. By staying home, you save lives. Uh, you, you feel, Jamila, you as the, you're developing your writing skills, your directing skills. You know, taking a history course, the reconstruction, you know, uh, Nigel, you know, you talked about your faith, how that has sustained you, is still sustaining you, and your activism, you know, and your relationships with your family and your friends, you know, and uh, so this, yes, this is, this is a... This is a challenging time, but it is also a time, I believe, to reimagine ourselves. And, you know, when I'm walking on the water, when I'm doing this show, when I'm in the class with you, Jamila, you know, and as I was sharing with Nigel, this is a, it's, it's like it's, it's taking me places like, wow, it's like it, it makes me happy. You know, and it's like, you know, it, it's like I'm, I'm real, I'm learning new things. I'm, I'm writing again in a way that I hadn't written in a while. You know, I'm interacting. I'm, I'm, I'm talking with people. Uh, my mind is, uh, my mind is, uh, is alive. I'm alert. So, I mean, we got a lot to be grateful in, even in the midst of this. What are we learning? Absolutely. What are we learning from the resistance? What are we learning, you know, as black women going forward? You know, how, how do we take all of this to the, you know, and help others and not only ourselves, but what are we, what can we bring to the movement that, we have, that we've always brought? I mean, we have always been the bedrock. I mean, if you, if you check it out, we have always been the bedrock of the movement. We're the ones who made the sandwiches. We're the ones, you know, who did so much, you know what I'm saying? Who drove, drove, drove the protesters around, made the signs, you know? Cooked breakfast, everything, you know? We're now, always, and, and that yes, was VP. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yes, that was from, yes, indeed. And, yeah. and, you know, we we wrote the speeches. I mean, up to Ella Mae Baker, people, Fannie Lou Hamer, Whose, whose shoulders we stand on, Shirley Chisholm, you know, uh, my goodness, you know, we can just go Mary, Mary Church Terrell, all of these women that we stand on the shoulders of, it just, uh, and I'm sure looking back at, you know, uh, one of my, one of my, my, my heroes as a journalist, um, um, Ida Wells, uh, Lady Bates, Yes, you know, uh, my goodness, women I fell in love with in school and learning, you know. 
So, I mean, we, we, we have a rich history. Every time I start to get down, you know, we have, you know, I, I, I get up again when I think about that, you know, when I think mm-hmm. about these women, you know, so absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Nigel, I see that you're, you're trying to get something in there. You're trying, what's on your mind? Oh, um, you, you know, I, I was just saying, you know what, in my head, I'm thinking about Kamala and, and when she made her yes. speech, you know, um, to accept the nomination for vice president uh, to be Joe Biden's running mate. And I just thought that was so miraculous at the end when she said, you know, our grandkids are going to ask us, you know, were we here in this moment? Were we here? And they're, they're going to ask us not always just how we felt, but they're going to ask us, what did we do? Mm. And I think it's so important that we really capitalize on that um, and, and really, really, you know, have some introspection and say, what am I doing to actually be part of the change? What am I doing to be part of the movement? Mm. What am I doing to, to actually shift the, the wrong into some of a right? What am I doing? Not just how did it make me feel? And so, yeah. um, so yes, we, we do have to, you know, just utilize this time to actually get some work done. You know, and I, I and you know, I, I have to I have to say, you know, it's it's been a, a, a roller coaster for myself um, publicizing my book. For those that don't know, uh, I am an author uh, and, and uh, my book is called Raising John's Boy. And it was primarily for single mothers and really providing some kind of structure for single mothers who are raising sons on their own. So now I, I coach uh, single mothers who are raising sons regularly. Now I do that and I love every bit of it and really just helping them them to really help their sons become the best, strongest men they could be um, in the midst of what we're going through Mm -hmm. under the the tutelage of their mother, right? And strengthening moms at the same time. So so that's been quite a journey. I've been loving every bit of that. Um, I also publish a magazine specifically for men of color. Um, it's called Thoughts. This is it right here behind me. Um, and so um, I, I've been, you know, getting the issue out for that. And that's been very, very trying as well. And I love every bit of it because I'm meeting, you know, interviewing people every day who's qualified for the position to really share their story and mm-hmm. be transparent about how they've been able to come from humble beginnings to where they are now, whether it be just successful fathers, successful husbands, successful CEOs of a company. But at the same time, you have to understand that we all, no matter what our struggle is, we as a people have to come together as one. That's the only way we're going to be able to really move some of the um, injustices that we see and make some real policy changes in our laws. And in the midst of all of that, though, Dijon, why why you feel we haven't really been able to do that? You know, the, what, what are those challenges, those barriers? What do those look like? Girl, you know what, Cynthia is is I tell you something. I know that I know that's another few hours. I know, that's you know. There is. That's a whole nother that's a whole nother monster. But you know what? The way the system has been, you know, between mm-hmm. uh, you know, systematic injustice and institutionalized injustices that are there, that's already been designed to keep certain people down, to keep us as black people down and us as people of color down, you know, that in and of itself, that whole notion, um, it it stems from, you know, chattel slavery. And it's just something Mm -hmm. that has been able to, uh, manifest itself even up until this day. So we have racial violence and as well as discrimination that we're still coping and dealing with. But one thing about black people, what I love so much about is that we're resilient and we keep getting up even when we get knocked down. And so, but I just invite all of us to continue supporting one another as sisters supporting each other as sisters and brothers. Uh, um, Part of Thoughts Magazine really is about dismantling some of the uh, generational trauma that has happened in the Black family nucleus. But at the same time, um, I want to encourage us as as individuals uh, to collectively come together. We have to learn how to collectively, and and I commend us because during COVID, we really have been able to take advantage of this time, and we've been connecting with one another through Zoom. We've been connecting one another, really, really lifting each other up, you know, in sisterhood and brotherhood. Um, and I loved every bit. I love every bit of it. I love watching my sisters on Zoom wearing their head wraps, being proud mm-hmm. to be black, you know, have their afros out. It's beautiful. 
And so, um, and same thing for my brothers. I love every bit of it. But now I want to see us, the brothers come together for their sisters, and I want to see the sisters coming together for their brothers. And that's the reason why I started Thoughts Magazine. Oh, thank you for sharing. And yourself, Jamila, going forward, what can we do? I mean, talk about these barriers. What's keeping us from, as uh, Nigel is saying, us having to come together the way we should? In your opinion. Well, I think that, um, like, like Nigel said, the coming together, whether we're being participants in um, in workshops or whatever, mm -hmm. I think it will help us to begin to formulate. How, I think everyone should say, how can I contribute to this ongoing struggle? Uh, and like you said, with the death of George Floyd, it has regenerated the movement, okay? And so we can't afford to, to let it die down. At the same time, it's I think it's important for every one of us to look at how can I participate, you see? And it doesn't have to be that you're out there in the marching, but all of us have a role to play and all of us need to assess where we are and try to figure how can, maybe it is by helping to get voters out for the election, you know? Yeah, maybe yeah. it's about, you know, writing some articles or, you know, attending different workshops, whether those workshops are, are, are virtual now. But there's a way that we need to, each one of us, look at how can I contribute to the struggle? This is the time to make change. And we need every one of us within, uh, within our individual capacity to be able to get out there and figure it out. And whether it's through your church, whether it's through your organization, is to look at how can I help be part of this movement? I mean, this is a phenomenal time because not only did George Flores that sparked the movement here, but it's made the movement throughout the world where yeah. all people of color, one, are recognizing and saying, we recognize what America has been doing to you black folks, and it's wrong. And that's that's phenomenal. And at the same time, they're also saying, and it's been done to us throughout the world. So our perspective not only has to be, how do we, you know, drum up this fight and make it public and, and, and make those changes come about here, but also in solidarity with people of color throughout the world to stop the abuse and the oppression that has taken place throughout the world. And I think that's the dual challenge. How do we, how do we fight our battle here, but how do we embrace our struggle throughout the world as well? And what, I love what you said, that we all can make a difference. 